it's been a long journey getting to this point with Arabella. Um, very thankful to have everybody on the team and the crew and all of the people who've been following along. And throughout this process, we've, we've done an all right job, I think, of kind of separating our journey here with Arabella and what's going on in our personal lives. So even through personal trials and ups and downs, we've uh, we tried our best to, to keep that separate. So it's not really pertinent to, to what we're doing here. But something has come up in my personal life that already is having a pretty big impact on the project and over the coming years is going to have a, a really, really big impact. Um, this summer we found out that my mom had a tumor in her chest cavity and by the time they got the insurance all figured out and operated, it was the size of a bowling ball when they removed it early this fall. The surgery went well. Uh, unfortunately, on one of the follow-ups, they found out that the tumor had shed cells into her bloodstream and that those had set up shop inside of her lungs. So my mom does not have a very good prognosis. Um, surgery isn't an option. She's started chemo and we've got a, we've got a long road ahead of us. So I've been, I've been pulled out of the shop a bunch for family things and mom lives next door. So I'm going to be around and helping her out with that. And we would really love to, to have mom at lunch and to have her be as healthy as she can be. Um, which means that we really need to hit our June deadline. Um, but with me being there for family and being pulled out of the shop, hitting June is, is going to be pretty much impossible. With, with everything going fairly well, it was still going to be a big push with this. There's just no way. So we are asking for help. We would love to, to keep the date of June 17th and love to have my mom there. I know that she would love to be at the launch and hopefully be in good health still. And to accomplish that, we're going to need help. We're going to need a couple skilled people. So we are hoping to hire two people starting sometime in January, February um, to focus mainly on interior and systems so that KP and I can keep chugging on the deck and the superstructure. Uh, but basically four hands are going to get, you know, four sets of hands are going to get a lot more work done than, than the two. And in a lot of cases with me being out one and a half. Um, so that's what's been going on. If I've seemed a little absent, a little distracted, <laughs> you now know why. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to the rest of the crew because they've been working diligently trying to figure out how we're going to make these goals happen. So for years now, this project has really relied on all of the support that you give us uh, in places like Patreon or by going on to our website and leaving something in the tip jar there. Um, buying something from the merchandise store or getting something for us off the wish list. Um, all of that support has been fantastic. Um, but in order to pay two skilled people, skilled enough to make sure that Arabella is going to make uh, the launch date with all that Steve has had going on, uh, it's going to take all hands on deck. And so in addition to all of those great ways of supporting us, we've done something special with our Bonfire t-shirt campaigns. As of this morning, we have reopened all of our bonfire campaigns. That means all of our previous designs are available, and we've also added 100% cotton t-shirts, long sleeve t-shirts, hoodies, for designs that before they weren't available. We really want Steve to spend time with his mom, and we want to make launch. So we would love your help and supporting us through this hard time by going to uh, our bonfire campaign. Any way you help us will be hugely appreciated.
With the main fiberglass layers for the cabin top on and sanded down, the next big step was to start building up the paint. But first Steve wanted to find a secure way of attaching the handrails without making a hole through the fiberglass. So he and KP came up with a solution. Well, fiberglassing the house top, it gives a lot of strength. We set these pads down yesterday in Thixo, which is a very strong thickened epoxy in a tube. Super handy. And they set up overnight, and that's what is primarily holding these pads to the fiberglass housetop. And we're also putting a few layers of fiberglass strips over the pads. And that way they'll be enclosed. There won't be penetrations through the pad and the deck, which will prevent possible leakage. And the last bit of carpentry before the paint could go on was making up these hatch combings that will go on the two skylights on the forward section of the housetop. These were also attached using Thixo and also bronze rink shank nails. While the first coat of paint dried upstairs, Larry Kindberg from Accutech, who we met last week, stopped by with the finished prop and shaft ready to be installed. One of the nice things about using the Vara prop is that we can keep the standard shaft with the cotter pin hole. We don't have to cut it off. Many of the feathering props and folding props require a shortened thread area. Okay. Now the reason that this is so good is you can just take and put a standard fixed pitch propeller as a spare prop on this without oh. and still have your cotter pin That's and everything on idea. there. Okay let me just check these keys. I think we're gonna have to shorten this key a little bit. Um, it's just a little bit too long so I don't know if you got a hacksaw. Oh I think we can arrange that. Okay <laughs> so what we want to do is just cut this off right about there because we don't want any overhang into the thread area. Take about six millimeters off. Yeah, and then let me uh, check this other key. Yeah, this one's a little long too. He left these long. And then why the stainless shaft and not uh, a bronze one like this one has? Um, the, stainless, the stainless will hold up a lot better. Bronze, because of the zinc content in it, you notice the pink in here? Yeah. That's called demetallization. That's the zinc leaching out of the uh, bronze. You want to you want to have about from the tip here. Yeah. You want an inch and a half to two inch clearance. Because it's a low speed, you don't have to worry about um, a whole pounding situation. You, your water your water's not going to pound up against the hull here and create a vibration yeah, because you got this dead wood here. So that's going to that's not going to be an issue. Beautiful. Any questions, Joe? Nope. All right. So we got to get the, I can continue working on the rudder. Okay, tolerances are fine to work on that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got to get the cutlass bearings put in. Should probably just pick up the stuffing box then. And uh, pick one of these semi-warm-ish days that we got. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when we hit maybe 50. <laughs> yeah. Sunday, I think, or tomorrow. And uh, sun is supposed to come out tomorrow. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And we'll see if we can get this thing aligned. Yeah. And then once it's lined up and bolted down, I can get everybody else in and we can finish up, get D'Angelo in for the exhaust and Nanny in for the diesel and Keenan in for the filters and 
Get it all going. When you live in the Northeast and you have hay fields, in the summer you watch for three days of no rain. And when there's no rain, you make hay. You drop everything, you make hay. You gotta do it when you got the weather, which we don't always get here. And this time of year in bow building, it's kind of the same principle. When we get a day that's above 50 degrees and we have 12 hours that's over 50, we drop everything and paint and fiberglass. Because right now, winter isn't here yet, but it's on its way. And every few weeks, we get this little one, two days at most where we break 50. And uh, we gotta make hay while the sun shines and we gotta pour epoxy when it's warm enough to do so. And then I gotta have to cut the corners. So you can just leave it there. And if you wanna start mixing up the next batch, I'll start working on it. We're putting multiple layers as well as some thicker fiberglass mat into the sole of the cockpit. And that is because that is going to lead a very rough life. Things are gonna get dropped. Um, someday a bottle will get broken, a knife will get dropped, a winch handle will get dropped. And we wanna make sure that those aren't gonna be able to pierce the fiberglass and that as we sand and do maintenance through the years, we don't have to worry about sanding through a thin layer of fiberglass. We've got plenty of epoxy and fiberglass to work with. The reasons for strip building and fiberglassing the cockpit and the house and the hatches is multifaceted. They are a little bit stronger than traditional built, they are lighter than traditional built, and there are essentially no seams to leak. So a complex shape like the house or the cockpit has a lot of joints and this way they are all encapsulated. So this gives us a light and tough structure and we've been trying to shave weight since the oak planking is heavier than the cedar planking so if we can knock a hundred or two hundred pounds out of the house between the house and the cockpit that makes a big difference the faces inside the boat are getting just one coat of fiberglass one layer and that's just to seal them up it's not really for for any other purpose than to seal that wood so that there's fiberglass on both sides. Go sweet fill coat, bub. The seats uh, and the flange around where we will sit and walk and live has three coats of glass and then five coats of glass on the corners. Since the corners get beat up the most dings and dents, uh, it's nice to have extra layers there. And that extra layers are put in simply by overlapping, doing a vertical and a horizontal and a vertical and a horizontal, and they all end up covering the corner. I'm gonna go next turn and just dump all of that across the top here. Top? Okay, yep. Yeah, just right across here. I'm gonna kind of work it across the top and water pull it down. Okay. And I can go mix up another batch. So the lion's share of work on the cockpit here is done. Uh, strip building it and fiberglassing it is by far and away the most amount of work. 
Still left to go is to trim the fiberglass kind of curtain that's hanging around it from the top layer. This whole thing needs a sand. Uh, we're not going to sand so far as to sand it smooth. We're going to just sand down any bumps and high spots, rough everything up, cover it in fairing compound, build that up smooth, and then paint it. And the reason for that is we want to leave all the layers of glass intact. If we were to sand this all the way down and we have three layers on the seat, there's a chance that we're going to get down to one layer in some spots. Uh, so what we would rather do is just rough it up so that the next layer has good adhesion and we knock down any real obvious bumps and then fill it in with fairing compound. And that's the same process we've done for the house top and the house sides. We've got a bunch of holes here that we cut before they were fiberglassed and then fiberglassed right over them. This makes cutting them out now really easy. Otherwise, we would be cutting through fiberglass, hardened epoxy, cedar, some bronze ring shank nails, uh, and that is trying to find a bit to cut through. That means it has to be carbide, and it's just a real pain. So by cutting through the wood and the bronze first, and then now we just have to cut through the fiberglass. That's really easy. This is the aft end of the cockpit. It'll slope aft, so we still have to cut and fit two drains in the bottom here. These are for port lights to vent the engine compartment. And then the big rectangles on the sides are for um, deck prisms that are going vertically, and that will shine light in and around the engine compartment, and that will help help things from getting moldy and funky back there and will make visually working back there easier. Um, we also need to drill holes through the seat for the fills for the diesel tanks. Uh, two of those will be coming through the seat. We need to cut a hole for that really sweet Edson pump that we have and get that mounted underneath. And we also need to figure out throttle controls for the diesel, which may go here in the aft end of the cockpit. They may go onto a box up here. They may go onto the combing. I'm not entirely sure yet. We've still got lots of options and we have some time before we get pigeonholed into picking one. Um, wow, the house top has transformed. That's what happens when you're not here for like two weeks. Eh, true. Sorry okay. I had to cancel on you last week. Yeah, okay, what do we need to do? All right, so you know Bob Emster who's doing the tender for us? No. No, all right, well. His YouTube channel is The Art of Built Building. Oh, yeah, then I do know. All right, good. I was going to say, that's going to be your homework tonight. If you're not familiar, that's your homework tonight. Go check out The Art of Built Building. And we need to make sure the tender fits on the house top here. So I asked... What's the tender? That's the little boat that we use to get to the big boat. Oh, I get it. Yep. So There's all kinds of words for it, too. Yeah. Dinghy, tender. Skiff. Skiff. Yep. So we are going to put that boat here, and it's going to sit upside down, facing forward. So the stem will be up here by the so mast. So when you out, hold on. Where will the dinghy be? The dinghy will be on top of the house here, when we need to go on somewhere top of far. These, yep. Or on top It'll of cover these? the skylights. There won't be much sun there. No, that's why we got so many port lights on the side. And it'll only be sometimes. Only sometimes. Like for offshore, offshore passages. Otherwise, you drag it behind you. Yep, and tow it. Oh. So if it's if the sea conditions are rough enough that they could sink the tender, or smash it into the boat, or do something like that, and you're not going to use it for days or weeks, this is where it goes. So we have to make sure it fits. Because if we build hatches and companionways and grab rails and Bob builds the tender and we're off, they're not going to be compatible. And that's going to be a wicked bummer. That does sound kind of evil. So I asked Bob to make us a full-size pattern of the tender, which he has so kindly done and mailed. So we're going to roll this out on here and see what we got. Can you help me spread this out? Yeah. Um, sure. You gotta be careful with it. What is that? 
Give me a telephone. I think it unfolds. It unfolds. You need that done. Oh, look at that. We got it faced the right way. What? 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 All right, perfect. Yeah. All right, and the main mast is about here. So we could always stick it like that. Or straight on. Half deck. All right. So we need to make sure. Can you pull that down and flatten a little bit? So here's the end of the boat. So we'll have to cut those companionway rails down, but they're too long anyways, so that's fine. And then it looks like he's got a seat here. So that works. Are those the ribs, these lines? These lines are his station lines, I think. Station mm -hmm. lines? For when he made the molds. Oh. So we need to make sure that the hatch that's here comes up between the aft deck and our center seat here. And it does with room to spare. It's like we planned it. Beautiful. I think that'll work. It's nice when we get something right. What do you think? Will that work, Aaron? Will it work? Will it work? And then this still leaves us room up forward for the door aid boxes. What are those? <laughs> they're like little ventilators that don't let water in. They keep water out, but they're open to the air. Kind of neat. I can show you what I'm, one out here. There's a model of it that David made. It's pretty cool. Door aid is the name of a boat. These are mock-ups Where they were the first, first used. So those are going to go like that. It'll be shorter. So that works perfect. The tender will clear a door raid box on either side. We got plenty of room on the grab rails. And then those companionway rails are pretty long, so that should be fine. We'll have to watch those, but I think this will work. I'll have to let Bob know the good news. Did he do the baffle Is on the it inside? Just gonna just watch shake. the video and then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we sometimes like to send send him a little. Yeah, we'll send him a picture. Bob gets Bob gets exclusive early footage. <laughs> so inside this, Aaron will be. This is just a mock-up of the outside for size sake, but a real droid box has some baffles on the inside. So essentially the baffles? Mm-hmm. Which are just they which must just be means flat <laughs> full of a <it>, kid. <laughs> so essentially there's like a big Dr. Seuss looking horn that comes out of here. It's kind of funny. It looks like a the end of a it looks like the end of a trumpet a little bit, but different. And then what'll happen is if water gets splashed in there, it would just go in it would just go inside, wouldn't it? If there was like a hole, you imagine there's a hole in here. Yeah. There's a hole here. Uh huh. And then, if water came in, if you wanted, if you wanted to have fresh air, it would just go into. The... What happens inside this is David will build these so that there is what a baffle is. Is it's it's just another piece of the box that would be in here, and its job is to stop water. So a baffle in any situation is something inside of a container or something else that stops water 
from moving or slows it down. So essentially there'll be like a, like it'll come all the way up to kind of here and then air will be able to travel through, but water will not likely splash in. Oh, so. So even a, if it's raining oh, or you're underway, you'll have fresh air coming so into the boat. So it's like a tubey thing. It's like a tubey thing. The water goes down in the, into this, but there's a passage here that lets air run through and the water just runs out. The water would run out. Of, yep, and you've already, you've already inferred that, yep, there'll be a drain there. Yep, that'll let the water out, but we'll let the you air in pass said it. There would be. Did I? Well, if there's a hole. Oh, like a circle? Yeah. So that's how, that's a dried box. Hmm. Sometimes called a dried box. Hmm. Okay. I've heard people call dried dried. D-R-I-A-D. It's one of those words that like someone like me would read and never hear. Exactly. And then it's just kind of like, I had a good friend who once we were talking about getting metal work done. And she says, oh, so you need a machinist. I was like, a machinist? Oh, you mean oh, machinist. <laughs> and she was like, is that how you say it? She's like, it's one of those words I've read a whole bunch of times, but I've never actually heard someone pronounce. And I was like, yep, I know a few. I'm quite sure it is machinist. And I, I read like once. Does I... you know how to pronounce machine? <laughs> like, oh, hey, look, it's a machin. <laughs> and I read, I read somebody said once, um, somebody wrote once that uh, you should never pick on somebody for pronouncing something wrong if they came to a word by reading. It means that they're really well read and probably just haven't talked about it yet. And they just need to know how to say it. But it usually means that someone's well read or at least that they're curious enough well to know read. a word. Yeah. That they've read a lot or have been hey, curious Aaron, enough to read us? about it. Okay, then I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> you know a bunch of words, you're not sure if you know how to say them. <laughs> Same. Same. Perfect, can we flip? Perfect. Uh, we're gonna roll up the hey, look at all right. Well, that's good news. Yes, that is good news. <laughs>